Thanks for coming. So this is, a, this is something that we started with uh, Gaston Navarro, who was uh, last year in the PhD in NYU, uh, and with Pedro Teles. Uh, and halfway of the project, we learned that uh, Guido Lorenzoni and Ivan Verding were working on something very similar. Uh, they're smarter and younger, except for Gaston, but he had to drag us into working on it. So they got, a, they got a versions earlier than ours. So all, there's, there's quite a bit of an intersection on the, on the things. And, and, they, and they came in first. So that's, uh, I wanted to make that clear. What? Well, I was going to say they're smarter, younger. But we are more, we're better looking, and we have a better title. But uh, I think that the discussion is going to disagree with me, reveal preference proves it. So. <coughs> um, we are making it more clear that we're being influenced by Guillermo Calvo's paper. Uh, but whatever. OK, so this is a, I'm not going to, I can talk at the end about what things are the same and what, what, what things they do that we don't and what things we do that they don't. But uh, for now, just let me tell you what, what, what this is about. So <coughs> and this is going to be, I'm still confused about many things. Uh, and, and when Tim was talking yesterday, I got the sense that it's going to, there's more intersection between what we do and what he does. But, uh, but I, I thought before he talked that there was not that much. So I, I just pretend there's not that much. But in a sense, the question is, is, uh, it's, uh, is very related. Uh, and the question is whether their sovereign debt crisis can be the result of self-fulfilling equilibria. Calvo made that in a, in a very simple uh, example, made that point. And there is a the notion that high interest rates imply then there's a higher probability of default. But then higher probability of default feedback into higher interest rates. Then the question is whether you can get more than one fixed point on that, on that logic. I, I've been thinking about this in the 90s in Argentina. Uh, Argentina defaulted in 2002. There was a very, actually at the end of 2001. There was a huge recession after that, almost as bad as the Great Depression. Two thirds of the Great Depression. Let me put a number. Uh, during the, all the 90s, there was a currency war. This is important because essentially means inflation was the same as in the US. So interest rates can be think of interest rates in dollars. Uh, and the average interest rate was like 10% during 93 to 98. This was a period in which Argentina was growing, and it was doing all the reforms that the Washington consensus was pushing for. And the average debt to GDP ratio during that period was 30%. So 30% is a number we understand as a very low number. But if you think in terms of a, this is going to be really back of the envelope calculations. But if you think of having a debt to GDP ratio and paying a constant interest rate forever and rolling over the debt, if you have a 10% rate and 30% debt to GDP ratio, that's equivalent of having a 3% rate and a 100% debt to GDP ratio. So obviously, the question that was in our minds at the time was, if we had been paying 3% instead of the 10%, then maybe we wouldn't have defaulted. So notice that this is 7% difference out of a 30% debt to GDP ratio. That's two percentage points of GDP. During 93 to 98, actually two more years without default, that's seven years at 2% of GDP. That's 14% of GDP of extra interest payments. That's both pretty much half of the debt. So with this notion that if the interest rate had been 3%, maybe the default wouldn't have happened, and maybe investors would have recovered all the all the money, it's a counterfactual that uh, Jerry and I could do quickly and, and then try to see whether that would be the case or not. So that's, that's essentially in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the card. So there was an attempt to get some, some, some relief or at least some, some, some lending from, from the IMF of the type that Tim was describing with uh, with Mexico in 94, but that didn't work, and then there was the default in 2001. Uh, and then Southern Europe, uh, it's, it's, I'm going to show you just some, some numbers. Now, rates were very low. They started increasing. Uh, actually, the team showed the, showed the plot. Uh, in this case, there was an intervention, a policy intervention by the ECB, these uh, out, uh, outright uh, monetary transactions. Uh, um, and rates went down. I mean, numbers for, for debt to GDP ratio were, were, were way higher. 
and we haven't seen default in Spain and Italy or Portugal. And looks like the market is not expecting these defaults. Okay, so these are the spreads on the on the on the Italian and, and Spanish bonds starting on, on, on 2010. And here's the policy intervention. Then rates came down. Uh, and I guess if you look at the union of the co-authors, we get three Argentinians, one Italian, and one Portuguese. Okay, what we do is we just take Arellano's model and show that that model exhibits, and, and then try to be specific about what assumptions do you need for this and what, what you don't. The multiplicity that I studied in, that, that was in Calvo's paper. If we were going to characterize equilibrium, and we, we were lost with value functions, so we went to a two-period model, and that's mostly what I'm going to do today, this, this two-period model. In that peri two-period model, I'll, I'll tell you what we're going to think about this, this, this policy as the one that either the ECB or the IEC uh, have been doing, uh, whether it makes sense that those can have a, a large impact on the rates. Uh, and then eventually, I'll, I'll, I'll show how we are writing down this infinite period model and how we're going to use a sunspot and, and try to see whether we can get behavior of spreads and debt and the evolution of the data as we see in the data. So somehow, this is also a model like in Teams that is going to endogenously tell us what the, what the debt is going, to, is going to do. Now, this evaluation of policy is actually an ongoing, an ongoing process because after the ECB announced the policy, somebody went to the German court and challenged that decision as unconstitutional. And the, and the Constitutional Court of Germany actually didn't make a decision. It sent the decision to the, to the European court. But in the statement, it made it relatively clear that they do not believe necessarily that this is constitutional. So whether this policy can be reverted by court, it's an issue that is today on the table. And I guess that if you believe the, this multiplicity and you think this multiplicity can be behind those behaviors on the spreads, maybe it is a good policy. Rod is going to ask, why not private bank? And I'll get to that eventually. But uh, that does, I'll get back to that. Doesn't mean I will answer the question. In a way, Rod is going to be satisfied. But, uh, but I'll get there. OK. So I'll give you the two-period model, which is, I, I, again, I'll, I'll talk about, mostly about it. Uh, And then the key here, so the, this, this, the key here is how do we write this, this function? There's going to be these atomistic lenders, as in Tim's model. And then there's going to be a function. These atomistic lenders are going to be willing to give, us, to, give to this country a rate, an interest rate, or a price of the bond. That's the same. There's going to be a function of debt. And debt, I'm, still, I'm, I'm going to put it in here. Um, I'm, I'm being ambiguous, ambiguous about this for the time being. And then I'm going to discuss equilibria. I'm going to give you the multiplicity. And then eventually I'll show you how we are, trying to, are, are playing around with the sunspot in an infinite period model uh, to engineer a sovereign bond crisis. Uh, but I will not show you the plus because we couldn't manage the value functions to converge yet with the sunspot. I got an email yesterday at 12. Gaston telling me, but tomorrow morning, I said, no, go to sleep. I'll tell them I'll show this plot eventually once we have it. So I'm not going to, but once I show you the dynamic programming problem, you'll understand where's the trick and how we can fool the model to give us pretty much whatever we want. And that's going to be my source of skepticism. So in a sense, the question is, what do I have to fit into the model in order to rationalize this as, a, as the outcome of the model and then to justify the policy intervention? And the answer is, well, you can't do it, but you have to put a lot. OK, so let me give you the two-period model. This is going to be consumption in the first period. This is an endowment economy. It's going to be populated by representative agent. For the, point, it's, it's, it, the, the, the environment is very similar to what Tim did yesterday, except that this is going to be just two periods. And it's going to be cooked to be simple. So endowment is going to be one on the first period. And then the second period endowment is going to be in an interval between one and capital I. OK, so this guy will want to borrow today. Income in the future is going to be higher, so it will want to borrow. So it's going to be a density on this and the corresponding CDF. So this is exogenous. And this is going to be important. This is one of the things we can play around to get multiplicity. OK, so in period one, agents can borrow in a non-contingent bond. 
in the international financial markets. <coughs> and then there is a risk neutral growth in international interest rate, which is going to be R star, or the price of the bond, which is going to be Q star. So at time two, after observing the realization of output, the representative agent decides either to pay the debt or to default. Is default, consumption in second period is one. Nothing important of being one, it's just a nice normalization. OK, so in these models, typically we use the representative agent in the country, takes into account the fact that by borrowing more or less affects the probability of default. And this affects the, the interest rate is going to be charged. So this is like a monopolistic uh, behavior in the sense of the, of the, in the, in, in, in the side of the representative agent. OK, and then lenders are going to be atomistic. <clears throat> OK, so, so every lender is small, but there's a continuum of them. Uh, so lenders offer a schedule of interest rates or of bond prices, it's the same, as a function of the level of the debt. And there are two classes of schedules. Once we have a debt contract, there are two classes of schedules that are consistent with zero profit. In one, so essentially here what, we, what we're going to do, we have to find a schedule of prices or interest rates that are functions of something such that when we solve the functional equation that says that profits have to be zero, that is a solution to that functional equation. And there, is, there are two types of schedules we can imagine. Uh, in the first one, oops. The first one we're going to get is that the Q, the schedule depends, depends on the resources obtained on the first period, which we call it B prime. B prime is how much you borrow today and that you're going to pay the, the, uh, the next day. So if this is the case, then the representative agent is going to default only when the utility in the second period, so it's going to happen. In the second period, you're going to see your output. Then you're going to compare your consumption if you pay the debt, which is your output minus the payment of the debt, or their consumption when you default that that's equal to 1. OK, so this is the utility if you pay the debt, u prime, u of y prime by prime 1 over q. And this is, when this is lower than 1, you default. So essentially, this gives you a threshold. There's going to be a certain value of output, so that the value of lower than that, you default. If it's higher than that, you don't. And then the probability of default is going to be given by the cumulative distribution function evaluated at the threshold. In the other class, we guess that the Q depends on the resources that are going to be paid on the next period. We call that VQ prime. These are the schedules that Christina uses. When you're solving a Stackelberg, you're saying, OK, the, uh, I'm producing first, the other guy produced second. So then I'm going to have a reaction function in which the guy is going to take my quantity as given. OK, and then I'm going to write reaction functions on how much I produce. How much I produce is just the number, how much I produce. Here we are conditioning on a debt contract. And the debt contract has two numbers. One number is how much money do I get today? The other is how much money do I get, do you, you get back tomorrow in case I pay? And I can condition the pricing on either. So notice that expressed now in terms of the BQ prime, the condition is BQ prime is whatever you have to pay if you choose to pay. So then if you get an output level that is below 1 plus what you have to pay, you better default and then eat 1. And then the probability of default is given by 1 plus the BQ prime. So the difference is that in here you get a price. In here you don't get a price. If you default, you consume 1. T tomorrow, the pr the, you're, you're, the, you're going to pay, if you pay tomorrow, you're going to consume U prime minus the BQ prime. So, this is, so the threshold is going to be, you're going to default every time your output is lower than 1 plus what you have to pay. Investors are risk neutral. So arbitrage in international capital markets implies that returns have to be the same. Returns on lending to this country or buying a US bond. The return of buying a US bond is 1 over Q star. So then this is the, the condition for foreign investors will, being willing to lend to this country, which is that they have to get the same return on both the US bond and the lending to the country. Lending to the country is going to be given by the interest rate that you get in this country, which is 1 over the Q, times the probability that there's no default. The probability that there's no default is 1 minus F of this function. So this, this is a functional equation. They were guessing that a Q of B prime is going to be a function of B, Q. it's essentially going to give you a Q of B prime. And this functional equation tells you that if you find a Q of B prime, 
that satisfies this equation, then that's going to be a potential schedule. It's not necessarily an equilibrium schedule, but it's a potential schedule. But it means that there's zero profit for the foreign lender. But then, when you're looking for functions that solve this functional equation that says that profits are zero, you can also look for functions that are functions of the VQ prime. So R is equal to 1 over Q. Uh, so the choice between it, whether it's interest rate or it's prices is not really important. What matters is if the schedule is defined over one variable or the other. One is the value of debt and maturity. Uh, if paid, the other is the value of debt when issued. And then whether you are one schedule or the other depends on which is the one that foreign lenders coordinate. There may be more. If there is only one, they're gonna, they can only coordinate on that one, but they could coordinate on others if there is more than one. Not on any decision taken by the small open economy. So, so this is where I'm not sure there is an issue about timing. It's an issue about, I mean, there is a current issue about timing. This is supposed to be all simultaneous. But uh, uh, the, the question was how you, how you modify, how do you think about variations of the environment that would select one skill or the other? Uh, and I have an ongoing discussion with Manuel about that, and I haven't converged yet. So the optimal choice of that will depend on which schedule the representative agent faces. And I will discuss this in the context of a specific example now below. And the equilibrium, of, there may be different schedules, so I'm going to define it with the Q of V prime, but it could also be with the Q, if in parentheses you have the ones with the, with the, with the VQ prime. And then the equilibrium is going to be a schedule and a point in the schedule, such that given the schedule, the point in the schedule maximizes utility for the country. The schedule solves the functional equation one or two, depending on which schedule are you considering. And of course, the interest rate is the one that corresponds in the schedule to the choice of the debt of the country. Let me, let me give you a little bit of a sense of, what, of, what, of what's going on. And, and for that, let me show you the two functional equations. So look at, the, look at first at the number two. In number two, given, given a VQ prime, this number is pinned down uniquely because f is monotonic on bq prime. This is, a, given, this is a number is given, so this gives you a unique q. So these schedules, they have to be monotonic. This schedule here, you have a given, given value for b, well, the q shows up here and the q shows up here. So there, this, this may not be monotonic. So let me, what I'm going to do now is focus on this, on, this, uh, on this condition, which is an equilibrium condition. If we are going to be thinking of schedules that depend on the B prime, this is an equilibrium condition. It's the zero profit condition. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to think of this function that is on the right-hand side of equation one. I'll plot it and, and, and show you what happens. OK, so this is what I would call the H function. This H function has to be equal to 1 over Q star. So notice that if 1 over q star is 0, this is 0. Uh, and if you go to the upper support, when v prime is uh, high enough, this gets to the capital I, the largest value for y, this is also going to be 0. In between, this is a positive. So for standard distributions, I mean, put a normal distribution or uniform distribution, you get this function which is concave, so you get at most two solutions. So essentially, what we have here is, is the R. Uh, um, this is for a given value of B. Okay, so we're basically fixing the B. Sorry, the, we're fixing the B prime, and we're solving for one over Q or for R. So what we have the, in here, we have the value for the one over Q star, for the or for the R star, which is one point oh four, and then here is the H function. So essentially, here's where you get uh, schedules that are not going to be monotonic. So when you condition the price that you pay, that they gave you for the bond, or the interest rate they'll charge you, on how much money you get today, you get more than, you, you get, sorry, you get schedules which are not unique. You don't get a unique R for a given value of B. You get these two solutions. Now this function H goes back, goes down, as you increase the debt. So eventually there is a debt which is high enough such that Nobody would lend you because you would default with probability one. And w another way to put the same plot is that here I had the R and I was fixing the B, and then I was getting two solutions. What I can do now is go to a plot in which I have the one over Q here, or the R, 
And here I have the V prime. And then this is going to give me the set of possible schedules. And then for every value of V, there are two solutions for the R. And this is pretty much the type. These are the schedules that Calvo was considering. OK, so this is what you get if you check the schedules on the V prime. Now, what happens with the other schedules? When the, the schedule conditions on the um, amount of funds next period, uh, well, then what you get is this functional equation. But as I said, here the Q has to be monotonic. There's no backward bending of this, of this schedule. So it's increasing in VQ prime with all the support. But of course, it's the same as before with only a change in variables. This is what Saki was saying. So while the schedule a Q V prime is increasing, it includes the high rate decrease in schedule when you measure it on the V prime, which is what Rodi was saying at the beginning. And maybe, and that's, maybe yeah, that's why it's an interesting point to check on schedules that depend on both. Uh, and in particular, high values of the V Q prime can be associated with low values of V prime and high values of 1 over Q. So essentially, this is what you get. The, so you get this. Is a possible, this is the solution of the functional equation for when you do it in the VQ prime. This is the V prime. This is the solution when you do it with the VQ prime. But of course, for every point in here, you're paying all this much next period because you got a very high rate and not that much much in the beginning. So of course, there's a one to one mapping from one plot to the other. And that's the sense in which you're saying, but you're, you're giving us the same, the same things. So there are solutions to the same functional equation, but it makes a big difference whether a representative agent in the small open economy faces one or the other. Because when we are here, we can think of the schedule being the blue one. Tim doesn't like it for some reasons, which you're probably noticing, and I'll go get into that. But as a solution, the blue schedule here is a solution of the functional equation. So in, think, in thinking of schedules of this type, the small open econ economy could be facing the blue schedule here. And then it will have to pick a value there. It's going to pick it the one that maximizes utility. But if facing this schedule, the country will never pick a point in here. So it's the maximizing uh, nature of the problem. When you choose within the schedule, you would never slip into the blue one. But if you're only considering this type of schedules, then you may have no other choice than slipping into the blue one. So once offered the increase in schedule, the representative agent will be able to pick a point in the schedule. By choosing the VQ prime, the probability of default is being pinned down. When you decide how much you pay tomorrow, that immediately pins down the probability. So in this way, the country can avoid the default probability associated with the high rate, high probability outcome. This is what Tim was worried about. The decreasing schedule is fragile in the following sense. Uh, so what I'm going to do, take a point in the blue schedule here. Now imagine that uh, you are considering this point, and consider the perturbation to the schedule. You take a point that moves horizontally to the left, so the interest rate is going to be the same. The debt is going to be a little bit lower, so the probability of default has to go down. So that means that if you start an epsilon to the left of the blue schedule, positive uh, profits are positive, and then lenders want to cut down rates. And they would keep on cutting them down until you go to the red schedule. So one would guess that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that a reasonable refinement would restore uniqueness. And actually, Guido and Ivan, they have a bunch of uh, more formal statements about, about, about that. Now, would that restore uniqueness? Well, now I can fool around with the f function. The F function is the distribution of output. And of course, you would tell me, well, you can fool around up to a point, because well, then we will ask you to calibrate it to data and then tell us that the distribution you are picking makes sense. So I'm going to pick one distribution that doesn't necessarily make sense uh, to show you how, how, the, how this works. So assume now that the output is going to come out of two independent. What I'm trying to, 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 to do is to show you what do we need to put into the model in order to get this multiplicity and then to try to rationalize this, the movements on the spreads, and then rationalize the ECB policy. So this would be like if you were making a case in the Constitutional Court of Germany. Well, probably you wouldn't use this, because, but, but, but this is the logic that we would use among ourselves. So if you have two independent random variables, both normal with different means, same standard deviation, but I'm going to move the means to make them bimodal. So now you're going to have a bimodal distribution of output. 
Uh, and then we're going to let the endowment in the second period be first nature is going to pick which of the two normal distributions. Then you're going to get a draw from that normal distribution. This is like a disaster, viral type of uh, disaster. If we get the mean sufficiently apart, then we get these functions for the, for the, for the zero profit condition of, of, of the lenders. So essentially, <coughs> where, where does the F function come from? It's just defined by the F. F is the cumulative distribution of output. So then the point is, how do you have to wiggle around with this distribution in order to get a non-monotonic, uh, sorry, a non-U-shaped non uh, uh, solution for the function H? It all depends on the probabilities of, of output. So we can get these type of, of solutions, and with these type of solutions, even if we do a steam does, which is let's get rid of the, of the downward sloping equilibria, you still can get multiplicity for some levels of that. For the blue one, you get only the good equilibrium in here. As the dead goes down, you push this curve downwards. But you get to the black one, you get one solution there, one solution here. If you keep on pushing it down, then you only get the, 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 the bad solution here on the red. But essentially, you can get, if the distribution of output is funny enough, you can get more than one solution. Now, is this empirically plausible? These means have to be really apart in order for these things to come in. So I don't think uh, the answer is going to be yes for that distribution. But one feature of this is that, so what I'm going to do now, the blue and the red dotted lines are the same ones I showed you before for the normal distribution. OK? Now I'm going to assume that I give an econometrician all the data for the last 80 years. And I want the econometrician to distinguish the distribution of output from the dotted li blue line to the full blue line. It's going to be hard, because it's as, as long as I make that perturbation small to tell apart from the data. If the data is slow, it doesn't matter. But as you start increasing the debt, then the multiplicity can start kicking in for, 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 for high values of debt. So essentially, the point here is that if the debt is high enough, I can make a small enough perturbation to any distribution you want and then get multiplicity. And you wouldn't be able to tell that in the data. So this, OK, I'm trying to say multiplicity here. It's hard to rule out the multiplicity based on the distribution of output we see in the data. That's more or less the point of this. Let me put it this way. If I come, if I come and, tell, uh, and tell you that there's multiplicity and I show you with that distribution, you're going to tell me, but you're using a totally ridiculous distribution to describe output in Spain. We need the two normals to be 30% apart. One is 6, the other is 4 on average. If I make them 10% apart, as, as, as Tim was showing in the data yesterday, I'm not going to get this, this bimodal thing. So the point is, if this would eventually give you a notion that, uh, that if the debt is high, then this multiplicity can arise in distribution that may not be so clearly at odds with the data. That's, that's what we were trying to do here. OK, then let me describe quickly the, and this would be my only, my only case against Roddy. If I, if I have one, it would be this one. You really need deep pockets. So the question is whether JP Morgan was willing to put 100 billion for and buy the debt of Portugal and make money with it. Uh, or whether JP Morgan was willing to put the 30 billion for Mexico in 94. So then assume just the off, it less to the country at a policy rate, any amount lower than or equal to a maximum to, to the to, to 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 the maximum. Imagine that. Let's get rid like when I show you how policy can get rid of the of the schedule that team didn't like anyway. But once you understand how you get rid of that schedule, you also understand how you can get rid of other, other schedules that are increasing. So essentially, this is putting a cap on the, on, the, on the schedules that can be offered in equilibrium, because the schedule the country is going to face is whatever is the schedule offered by the international lenders, the mean between that and the mean between the policy rate. So there cannot be any equilibrium with an interest rate larger than whatever the policy rate is, because the, the lender with deep pockets is offering them uh, there. Now, if well designed, the amount borrowed from the large lender is zero. And the way to do it is if we, if we go to the schedule. So, imagine, so essentially, if you offer this rate, any rate above the, the, this value, or the, the rate that it gets, gets you to the maximum B, 
then the schedule the country faces is going to be whatever is faced by, by, the, by the R. But uh, this one cannot be an equilibrium because positive are prof profits are positive here, so then lenders would undercut that one, and we get to the red schedule. OK, so then essentially a, a policy that puts a cap on the interest rate but puts it above this, the red schedule is going to rule all other possible schedules, and in equilibrium is going to lend zero. Because then the only one that for it, because if it were lending some amount, it would be making profit, and then lenders would undercut that to get to capture those profits. So there, they, this is the way the policy would would actually would actually work. Uh, but the, the level of lending offer has to be limited, of course. Otherwise, there could be very very high levels of lending that the, the country would take at those rates and then default afterwards. So having a cap on the on the on the on the amount is important. So. Where is it that we are at now? Well, we're, we're going to write the infinite period model. Uh, output is going to be in, in, this, uh, in this bounded support. The value of outer key is going to be given by a number. If you default, you get the same output forever. And, and we only explore the interest rate schedules for, for the Calvo type of schedules, because in the other, there is a unique equilibrium. In the schedule in which you condition on the BQ prime, then there is a unique equilibrium. You get the whole schedule. The country chooses the best. So that's how you get the Pareto, the best, the best equilibrium. If you only consider schedules in, in the VQ prime, the outcome that you're going to get is the, is, the, is the best outcome. So, uh, so then the interest rates are going to depend on the B prime. They will also might depend, they will depend on output because of the Markov structure of output. Uh, and they're also, we're going to make them depend also on the, on the sunspot variable that will select one of the multiple schedules that you can get. And we are going to be focusing on the increasing schedules, so Tim does not complain that much. And it's going to be based on the bimodal distribution we study above, so we're guessing that we're going to get, we don't really know, but we guess that, even in the, that at most we're going to get two increasing solutions. And then we're going to have a sunspot every period, which is going to be either one or two, with probability p. And the value for the representative agent after deciding not to default is going to be given by value functions and schedules that will satisfy this, this functional equation, this uh, dynamic probability problem. So uh, your utility, uh, the, your, uh, the V is going to depend on, on omega. Omega is your wealth after you see the shock if you pay your debt. Um, the output, because it affects the probability of outputs in the future, and the sunspot. Here we're assuming you are on the good side. The sunspot came out nice and, and good looking. So then you're on the good schedule. Now the schedules depend on the debt, but also on the sunspot. But you know that mañana, to, mañana. <laughs> domani, tomorrow you're going to be in the good sunspot with probability p, and in the bad sunspot with probability 1 minus p. So with probability p, you stay within the same value function. With probability 1 minus p, you go to the 2. But today you're in the good schedule, so you're in 1. And then, of course, symmetrically, you're going to have the problem at 2. Uh, and then with probability p, you stay at 2. With probability 1 minus p, you go to 1. And then you are in the bad schedule. OK, so the only thing I'm going to show you now, OK, then we have to put conditions that the schedule must satisfy. Uh, so in state one, investors offer this schedule. But they know that the following period, is the, the state is going to be one with probability p. And the default thresholds are going to be different. So if tomorrow the sunspot come out in the bad way, then the default threshold is going to be different than the. So now they have to compute the two different default thresholds. And the interest rate they're going to charge today, even in the good state, it's going to be affected by the fact that tomorrow, with certain probability, you're going to be in the bad state. So why we find this is an interesting way to think about it, because when we get this multiplicity, still we get two different equilibria. So you, would be, you should be jumping from one interest rate to the other. So you should basically have these jumps, and not these smooth transitions that we have in the data. So even if you have the two equilibria, it looks like it's hard to reproduce that plot. But how can we cheat? to reproduce that plot, it's not that you went to the bad equilibrium, it's that the probability of going to the bad equilibrium goes up. That is, fooling around with the sunspot? Yep. But I think that's what we need in order to try to reproduce the, that plot. Last comment, and then I'm done. Uh, so even if we can fool around with the probability of the, of the of, of it, so the interpretation then here would be that we're still at the, in the good schedule but that the probability of going to the bad schedule increased. Maybe because the debt went up, and then the other equilibrium showed up. So how do we, what would be then the way to try to get this plot? And this is where our skepticism, or at least mine, I don't want to get my cheese. OK, so then this thing going up smoothly, 
is about the probability of going to the bad state going up. But then in our model, if you do the policy and you do it right, you just kill the second equilibrium. So that means that the probability of being in the other is zero, so this should have jumped immediately. That's what our model is going to give us once we put the policy. So there seems to be too much symmetry in the coming up and coming down for you to buy the interpretation we are giving for this. But we, haven't, we couldn't come up with a better one yet. Because they clearly would be, we're giving a lot of role to expectations in here. But I think I'm going to stop right now. Uh, so uh, I'm happy to discuss this paper because I, I can think also about Europe uh, looking at this paper. So I learned uh, a lot to look at that. So the general idea goes back to team uh, paper yesterday. If sovereign debt crisis can be generated by changes in expectations, and expectations in the title. And, uh, and one has shown us that uh, a simple model with sovereign default can generate multiple equilibria. And the idea is just simply going back to the Calvo model, uh, reviving Calvo, uh, uh, where uh, basically, what, what do I mean by that? I mean, here I have a slightly different interpretation uh, from the authors on, on the result. I would say that uh, there are two models, two different ways of determining that, two different type of contract that we allow in the models. And in one case, we make the interest rate schedule contingent on the market value of debt. In the other case, uh, in a fa of the face value of debt. And when we do that, uh, in one way, we get multiplicity. I'll, I'll show you that again. <laughs> and then the authors have shown us how some of these multiple equilibrium may actually be killed by a stability criterion. And uh, we have talked about policy. And then the quantitative part of I, uh, we, it's still in progress, so I guess I'm not going to talk about that. So just to sum up the environment again, uh, we have a representative agent in a small open economy. It's an endowment economy in period one. Uh, uh, the endowment is one, in period two is random, and uh, Y in period two is going to be distributed according to some F, and the support is uh, the minimum bound is one, and the upper bound is big Y. I didn't write that. The initial level of debt is zero, uh, and then in period one, uh, the agent can borrow uh, uh, in a non contingent bond in the international market. And then in period two, it decides whether to repay or not. If it default, the lender gets nothing, and the borrower gets one. That is the minimum bound, the, the uh, lower bound of the distribution. And then uh, uh, what about the lenders? They are risk neutral, and the risk-free risk rate are star. So this is, again, the way I interpret the results of the paper. Like There are two, two variants of the model. In one case, uh, the mm, sort of uh, going back to, to Calvo, and this is also the same spirit of uh, Ivan and, and Guido's paper, uh, agents choose how much financing they want. Okay? So they choose how much they want to consume today. They know they have endowment of one, so they need to borrow the rest. They need to finance uh, uh, um, uh, one minus, uh, uh, sorry, C0 minus one. The lenders then choose a schedule, R, that is conting contingent on that financing, B. And then uh, the amount repaid uh, is going to be equal to B times the R of B, okay? DT. In the other uh, variant of the model, kind of uh, more in the spirit of Arellano, uh, instead agents choose how much to repay if they're going to not default. And then the schedule is going to be contingent, contingent on that, let, let me call it D. And so how much financing they, they're going to get the agent in, in, in the first period is just D over R of D. Um, so in the first case, we get multiplicity. In the first variant of the model, in the second variant, we get uniqueness. And why? Well, it's very simple. So the agent is going to repay uh, his debt if and only if what is going to be left with next period after you repay is uh, uh, not smaller than uh, his endowment, the, the, what he gets in case of default, which is 1. So y minus b times R uh, of B smaller or equal than 1. Sorry, in this case, it defaults, actually. So the inequality is reversed. Um, so, what is, so then we, we have a, say, no arbitrage condition for the lenders, which is uh, the lender, if he has one, uh, one uh, dollar, he can get R star if you go to the uh, international market, or he can get RB by lending to the lender times the probability of. Uh, uh, no default, which is 1 minus the cumulative of 1 plus BR. 
In the other case, everything is similar except that now, what is uh, uh, the uh, probability, uh, when is that the guy is going to default when y minus d, because he picks d, so he picks what is going to repay, okay, in case it doesn't default, uh, is smaller or equal than 1. But then in, the in, ca in this case, the non arbitrage condition, this probability, the probability of default does not depend on the, on the schedule, because he already told you what he's going to repay. So there is no the, the, the endogeneity that generates multiplicity in the first case. So you can see that the first equation there up there is a, a, a quadratic, I mean, depending on the distribution, uh, may have multiple uh, solutions. This equation here has a unique so solution. Okay? So this is the graph that uh, uh, Wampa showed us, uh, so, or similar to the one that he shows us. So, let me define hr given b. Let's fix a b. So h of r uh, given b is the expected return of a, for a lender who lent to the, um, to the country uh, who is borrowing b. So it's the right hand side of that equa upper equation there. So from now on, I'm just forget Arellano and focus on the first uh, uh, paper, OK? So on the first version of the model. So take that equation. The right hand side is the expected return of lending to the, uh, to the country. Uh, and for the fixed B, it's uh, just uh, the uh, drawn here. On the x-axis, we have R. So the, uh, let's, fi let's fix, for example, B to 1, B1. We have the up curve there. And then uh, this equation there is going to pin down what is the schedule, R. In particular, here I can pin down what is R of that B by looking at the intersections of that curve with the, the R star, the red line. And you see that we have two points of intersection here, so potentially two different R conditional on that B. Then when B increases, the expected return decreases because the, the default probability actually increases, and so this schedule, the, the curve shifts down, and the two equilibria are going to become closer to each other up to a maximum B that uh, uh, the, the agent can borrow, where we have only one point here. So then uh, we can think about, for example, two schedules that uh, the agent thinks to face. One is just pinning down the, uh, for each B, the smaller R, the, the smaller intersection here, and for the other one, uh, the bigger inter intersect, the, the bigger R, so that we can get the figure that Wampa shows us. So in this case, this part here is the portion, is, the, mm, is a schedule of R of B, where I'm pinning down always the good R, the low interest rate. And here is the schedule, the downward part is the schedule of R, where I'm pinning down always the high R, that is going to give us the bad equilibrium. In general, we can have a continuum of schedule because we can pin down, for example, for each B, we can go up and down as much as we want. So for example, here, the red one is one. I'm, I'm just for this B up to here, I'm pinning down the lower schedule. For this B, B between here and there, I'm pinning down the upper one, and so on. And they can construct a continuum of schedule. Now, we go back to the stability problem. I'm going to show you this with this graph in, in, instead of the other just to rebuild the intuition. So here we said, let's fix a B. I'm going to kill B by B, the, the high interest rate. Okay? So let's fix B. So let's take the continuation game from there on. So uh, we, here we have two R possible. Now imagine that there is a deviation. If this was the R2, imagine that somebody offers an R hat that is slightly smaller than R2. Well, then. Uh, the lender is going to make positive profit because the expected return of lending to the country is bigger than our star. So some other lenders will find optimal to undercut and uh, offer even a lower R, and so on and so on, up to where? Up to this point here, because then if we cut R even more, we get negative profit. So the only uh, R uh, that is uh, stable, uh, uh, condition on B, is, uh, is, the, the only, is this one, is the lower one, R1. So we can do this B by B and basically, sorry, kill the upper part of the schedule, and we are going to be left with only with the downward part. So then uh, that's game over for uh, uh, multiplicity. Well, no, we could, put, we could potentially get multiplicity if we get more intersection with the R line for each, po each possible B. So 
Wampa shows us that with different distribution, we can get a picture like this, where we can have actually two stable equilibria. Okay? So, and in this case, we can have basically two upper sloping potential schedules. Okay? So we can kill the downward ones because of instability, but we, can, we are still left with two potential schedules and anything uh, that things down, things between the two of them. Okay, so now one condition that the authors look for is a sufficient condition for uniqueness uh, where we define multiplicity in, in the, with this uh, potential local deviation. And uh, they look at the, um, I, I told one already, they look at uh, the function, this function, the function h to be concave, but actually quasi-concavity is enough, so I guess we can find a slightly weaker condition that uh, just uh, require quasi-concavity because you just need a single peak. And then the nice thing is that the sufficient condition is not going to depend on B or R or anything. It's going to depend only on the, on the other rate of the distribution. So this is nice to check. And uh. oh, then the policy. Uh, so um, what about the policy uh, that uh, uh, Wampa was thinking about, I guess, was the whatever it takes uh, by Draghi that Tim was talking about yesterday. This policy actually was announced. Uh, but never effectively used. So Draghi said, okay, I'm gonna be willing to buy in the secondary market bonds from, uh, from countries that want me to do that. In exchange, they have to write some, I mean, they have to uh, accept some economic measures to do some economic measures and so on. Uh, but actually, this was, the announcement of this was enough to push down the, in the graph that uh, uh, Wampa shows, uh, showed us the, the, the spreads even if it was not actually never used. So one way of rationalize this is thinking about a deep, deep pocket agent who offers to lend any B that is more or equal than B max, say at R B max, okay? And, uh, and, 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 and they showed us, I mean, Wampa just showed us that this policy would work uh, with a stable and unstable equilibrium. One thing that is uh, easy to show is that actually this policy seems to work even if we have multiple stable equilibria. Because the idea is simply basically the one that you were mentioning of global stability. So basically the idea is that you take, take in a fix a B, this is the H function, uh, take, uh, assume that the, 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 the deep pocket agent offers to buy anything below B max at this RP, the green line here, that is equal to Rb max, which is gonna be always to the left of this R2 here, okay? Of the, because remember that for B max, this thing was, uh, uh, the, the H curve was tangent to the red curve. So if we choose a, a Rp that is an R max, it's gonna be always to the left of R2. And this is important for the policy to work, okay? Um, if you do that, then you kill automatically all the R that are to the right of that because nobody's gonna borrow for some R bigger than something that you could borrow at. And uh, this is not gonna be, nobody's actually gonna borrow at that RP because uh, if, there was, if somebody was borrowing from this deep package agent, some other lender could offer an R that is slightly smaller, slightly smaller up to R1. So in fact, this is just the announcement of this part is just gonna kill all the other equilibria and just leaving us with a good equilibrium that is never gonna be used. Okay? Now one thing is important where this green line is gonna be. So in a sense, uh, I mean, it's tricky to think about the policy because if you put this green line here, it doesn't work, right? If you put an R that is too big, uh, actually it may not work because there you, you do negative profit. So uh, I mean, that's something that to think about. I mean, it's not the obvious. It's not that for anything they say is gonna work. Um, so with the policy, we are gonna be left only with the good uh, equilibrium. Okay. Last thing I wanna say. Uh, one uh, one nice thing about like talking with Guido that they do, and I think it would be interesting to look here, given that they do also more quantitative analysis, is uh, imagine now that the country um, eh, when default. Uh, can, uh, I mean, the lender can actually recover something. It's not zero what it gets, okay? So say that it gets some X, okay? Here, actually, I forgot to update that. So imagine that it gets some X here uh, after default. So they expected the return not dependent on RB. Forget that it depends on RB, just X. And uh, then the, um, 
the condition for um, the no arbitrary condition uh, is going to have a different uh, right hand side, right? Because now, if there is default, no default, the lender gets R. If there is default, uh, the, getter, the lender gets something. And actually, here, if this is an X constant, it's going to get just X over B, right? Because for $1, it's going to, I mean, the stuff is going to be split among the people that are going to get that. So it's going to get, for $1, it's going to get the x over b. So in any case, so for large r, what's gonna, what this uh, thing, this recovery is going to do is that when r is large, and so there is going to be some, uh, and there is going to be default for sure, the lender is going to get something. So there is going to be a, a, a lower bound here where this function is going to go here, right? Because it is not going to go to zero. The, the, the lender gets something even if there is default. And so this means that if B, so one thing that was nice about what Wampa showed us is that it, with the different distribution, you can see that if B is bigger, you have uh, actually higher probability of multiplicity. Or if B is more smaller, you get lower probability of multiplicity. In this case, is for a given distribution, it's just from these mechanics that uh, um, if B is smaller, you, this thing shifts up and you may be left with a, a good equilibrium. So you can get something like this, where for some range of B that is small enough, you have a unique equilibrium. And for bigger B, you can have multiple equilibria. Now, one nice thing about this uh, is that, I mean, this is not a new point. I mean, it's also in Diamond and Dibbic. But this is going to impose some restriction on the probability of the bad equilibrium. Because uh, if you say that uh, you are a uh, borrower, you know that you can pick this B here or some B where with some probability, so imagine that now we have a sunspot that uh, you assign some probability to the sunspots, and when you're choosing your B, you know what's the probability of the good and the bad equilibrium. Now, if you put a too high probability to the bad equilibrium, then you may prefer to choose the B that is in the uniqueness region. So the nice thing is here that uh, this gives you some constraint on what you can get quantitatively in terms of crisis. Uh, so you cannot get, it's not that because we have multiplicity we can get everything, okay? Even you, you, you get multiplicity and you're going to get some restriction on what uh, the probability of a crisis is going to be because otherwise people may choose like, not to go in the region, not to choose a BI enough so that you have a crisis. The rotation is coordination. So that's what you were saying before, that instead of R, yep. if you want to think about a multiple equilibrium, you want to think that somehow it's very hard for so there's a difference between yes. in the 80s. Yes. 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 In the 80s, where there were a few banks yes. that actually yes. put together all these dead packages, yep. yes. there should not have been a crisis. No. Not of this type. Not of this type. Not of this type. No, no, it's clearly the, the notion that this, these guys are atomistic and they, and they coordinate well, on something. Well, and they, right? Yeah, so yeah. The exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Lender. Absolutely. Yeah. So no, and, and, and I mean, thanks for the, for the, for, for the comments. The, the, the just as a, as a, as a commercial, uh, Guido and Ivan have a very nice analysis of maturity in a continuous time model, which I cannot handle. So, uh, but, 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 it's a, but I, of course, we don't do anything on that. I, I'm still going to insist, though, on my interpretation, which is that when you, for an equilibrium, you need a function that satisfies that functional equation, and there are. And I can define the support on the B prime or the support on the BQ prime. So I, to me, they're the same model. Uh, and then they're multiple equilibria of the same model. In Christina, let, let, let me add one thing. Let me add one thing. In, 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 in Christina, uh, there is the assumption that you can commit within the period, and then you can pick the BQ prime. But then, of course, if you pick the B prime and the BQ prime, you're picking the interest rate. So, so then, if you, if you assume that, you're picking the interest rate, and then you're going to get the best interest rate that you want. I, stayed a, a bit, I got hung up on that slide where, the, where you define both schedules. And something that we, that we do know is that um, you know, in equilibrium, there's going to be combinations of consumption that the guy has to pay back, uh, that he will pay for the certain probability, and then uh, you know, another number that is what he gets in the, in the first period. And that should characterize all possible sets of, of, of equilibria. Uh, once you know you take the probability of repay into account, so there must be something about what these functional equations do to select a 
I'm just claiming that there are more than one solution to that functional equation. Well, that's, that's, that, there's more than one solution to that functional equation. Well, that's all I'm saying. Both are solutions. I have a definition of equilibrium. I have a functional equation that needs to be solved, and I have many solutions. That, that's all I'm claiming. But I, maybe we have to keep on in private because. <coughs> okay.